I'd like to welcome you to lecture 17, which is um, chapter 12 on the central nervous system, part two. And in part one, we looked at the um, brain and the surrounding coverings of the brain and the CNS. And now we're going to focus primarily on the vertebral column, where it contains your spinal cord. So when we look at the spinal cord embryologically, again, very much like the brain, you know, it's, it starts out as that um, cluster of skin type cells called neuroblasts which are actually related to the melanocytes the pigment cells of your skin and we have that flat plate and a wing type plate and we get that neural crest as expected but when we look at the vertebral system as it gets older here's the hollow component now we see that within it we have these um already this group of um glial cells in there that maintain the cerebral spinal fluid, which is really kind of neat in that central cavity. Uh, um, and they don't show the outer regions yet, and there's actually no bone around this yet. So um, we see already that it's developed. It, it, we have already the uh, right and left half that is formed, and all of what's called the ALR plate, basal plate, which just means your, your um, dorsal and your ventral region have also already segregated so that means if this is your ventral that is your motor region there's your sensory region and look at that these are all the cells that are in the cns itself that will go up and down between the body that means inferior superior from the bottom of the body to the brain and they're going to run you know again up and down and that these branch off to form you know more or less your um spinal nerves so that's kind of neat, but you can see the origin of some of these nerves is going to be either inside, in the case of your motor region, in the case of your sensory region, on the outside here. And that's a typical sensory neuron right there. So this is kind of neat how you already see the segregation very early in development into these functional um, sensory and motor regions in the left and the right half of the uh, spinal. So when we look at the adult uh, spinal cord, its location is obviously uh, in, in the um, vertebral foramen, and it begins officially below the medulla oblongata at the foramen magnum. And this is right if you feel just the base of your head is that little area where you can literally poke your finger between the occipital bone and the um, atlas bone. And, you know, you can stick blades in there. There's all sorts of stuff. You can do needles. It's a very vulnerable area. Okay, and don't worry about the conus medullaris. Um, its function is going to be uh, two-way communication to and from the brain. That means it's sending signals from the body, from the viscera, in some cases up to the brain and then from the brain down and out. So it's a communication between the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system. Also, it acts like a mini brain because it has little reflex areas that we talked about earlier, literally in each spinal division. And also it's for left and right what we call lateral communication. The spinal cord, just like the brain, is protected by bone and, of course, meninges. And, of course, it's protected by much thicker bones, the, uh, the wing processes and the transverse processes of the spinal cord plus the body, I mean, of the, of the uh, vertebral column in the body, the vertebrae. Okay, uh, it's also protected from pinching by the, by the way the vertebral column bends and uh, extends and flexes. Okay, so don't worry about all this little specific stuff, but basically it's protected by that vertebral foramina and also by cerebral spinal fluid, okay, and its own meninges. So this is looking at a uh, more of a um, sagittal section, actually a mid-sagittal section of the spinal uh, cord and the vertebral column, and this is shown in your lumbar region, obviously. So this is looking at the layers. So we see your dura mater, arachnoid pia mater. I'm not going to ask you to label this. And then there's a large cavity here where your cerebral spinal fluid is. And you can see this is an injective site sometimes for um, uh, um, uh, anesthetics because many anesthetics do not penetrate the blood-brain barrier. They do not get into meninges. If you want to do a real quick numbing of a particular uh, um, region or of the whole literally spinal cord you know you would put the injection directly into the cerebral spinal fluid and luckily there are proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid that do break down to anesthetics but you got to be real careful due to genetic variability of people and their ability to um, tolerate 
that medication. Drugs like antibiotics can be directly put in here too because bacteria will get in here through various ways and there's very little immune system to fight it. Okay, and this again is showing, this is showing an anterior view. There's your spinal nerves, the spinal cord. Look at the branch points and look what happens to the spinal cord as it gets toward the sacrum. It actually loses its cord-like features and just becomes a bunch of basically nerves. Okay, nerve tracks in some cases. So when we look at the spinal cord, what is it associated with? The 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which again, this is the way station of how the spinal cord gets information in and gets information out to the body and to the viscera. And we see a cervical enlargement, lumbar enlargements, lumbar meaning the lower back, that uh, serve as almost like a little mini brain for uh, uh, coordinating the upper and the lower limbs, usually for posture and for complex movements. And then we have the cauda equinae, which means the tail of the horse, actually. And this is where you see the spinal cord is no more of a spinal cord and more of a bunch of branches that handle the uh, inner lower leg and the, re and the external genitalia. So now this is a transverse section showing your, this is a cervical vertebrae, which you should be able to recognize by uh, the process there and by the fact that you have every small body and look at the foramina openings there. You don't see that on the regular vertebrae. Okay, so, um, and now understand that the spinal cord is tiny. It is very small because first of all, it's surrounded by these thick meninges. Okay, you get some fat in there a little, some other stuff to cushion it. And um, then you have, um, your anterior horn, your posterior horn, so that's your sensory region, your motor region there, okay, and then your intercalary area here, which is sort of like the brain's corpus callosum to connect left and right, but the spinal cord is very small. Just think about the opening to the cervical vertebrae, how little that is, the little uh, um, vertebral foramen. So it is a very small structure, but very complex, and we look at it too, you can see Unlike the brain, the white matter is on the outside, gray matter on the inside. And the brain, the gray matter is on the outside, and the white matter is internal. But that doesn't mean that. But that does means that axons are running up and down through here. Well, this is actually the integration center. That means that controls reflexes and acts like a mini brain. So you have this little mini brain of ganglia that just run up and down and side to side in this little butterfly region. Again, another view of the meninges and the coverings. And again, you can see your dorsal, lateral regions, anterior. Look at the blood vessels in that subarachnoid space. There's your arachnoid layer, your dura mater. Pia mater underlies the blood vessels, acts like another barrier to protect against the blood vessels. And they don't show the blood brain barrier because it'll obscure the blood vessels and also obscure some of the nerves. And there's your. Uh, your uh, cranial, your, um, I'm sorry, your spinal nerves. Okay, and you got your dorsal root. And look at that right there, that little bump. And there's your ventral pathway. Now, the gray matter. The gray matter is divided in two horns. I just explained that. And this is where you find the control center of the of the central nervous system which is the vertebral column and then you have this thing called the dorsal root which is a bunch of nerve cells that contain sensory bodies so these act like two parallel spinal cords that are not wrapped in bone that run parallel to much of the spinal cord and you'll see a view of this in a minute it's very neat so the gray matter is found in the horns and also in this area called the dorsal root, which again is gonna be a mini brain that has a lot of autonomic control of the body. So here we go, your gray matter, and look at all the different regions, don't memorize this. And there's your dorsal root, and you can see that those are sensory nerves. Whenever you see something like that, those are sensory. Motor neurons are gonna be related to here, where the body is inside the actual spinal cord itself. So again, this is just showing the pathways and these pathways are broken down in specific regions that handle different information, going up and down and side to side and controlling reflexes. Now the white matter, 
It's white because what you're seeing is myelin. It's not really white, it's glisteny. And it kind of has a different texture than the gray matter. And what this mostly is, is going to be tracks that, that predominantly go up and down in the body. And they basically communicate signals, again, up and down, but very specific signals. We have what are called ascending tracks and descending tracks, and these are not in the gray matter. These are just axons that originate in the brain or originate somewhere else. They get their signals from everywhere else or send their signals elsewhere. And usually what they do is they communicate to here, and then these signals can go in and out here. So they are running up and down, but they do communicate this way, but also primarily up and down. So don't worry too much about them, but you can subdivide this into little mini brains here called, uh, you know, uh, cortical spinal tracts that take very specific information and trunk it so that the body knows where information is coming from and where information has to go. And it gives an awareness of the body and a specialization. So ascending tracts are usually sensory information coming in descending tracks, basically motor information of some type going down and out throughout the body. Now, remember we looked at, when we're looking at the spinal nerves, how they can correlate to these little areas called dermatomes and these little regions of the body, sections of the body, tome means to slice, okay? Well, we can see this again when we look at spinal cord damage, and we can color the regions to where the particular sections of the spinal cord itself, not so much the spinal nerves, but the spinal cord itself now is associated with it. And this is where physicians can tell where a disc is slipped and causing problems or where there's actually damage to the spinal cord. So again, you can see the regions where the lumbar is, where the sacral is, and where the thoracic are and the cervical. Okay, it's really kind of a neat little pattern. When you look at it, your part of your arms, okay, or most of your arms and shoulder and is actually controlled by the cervical vertebrae. And again, this is in coordination with other in your autonomic nervous system, other tracks that come out, other nerve tracks that come out from the body. And last but not least, we could also look at movement, motor function, and sensory function to determine spinal cord damage level. So what a physician can do is they can look at muscle tone, because if they're, if the cervical, ver I mean, if, if the vertebrae are not sending signals to the brain to maintain what is called a, 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 a graded neural responses, muscle has no tone, because sometimes you just want to send a signal that gets the muscles to twitch, but not to contract, just a little signal in there, keeps the muscle tissue going, keeps it alive, keeps the calcium, pumps functioning and all of that, and that develops muscle tone. So sometimes when people get older, they lose muscle tone due to a decay of that, of uh, neural signals, and people that are, that ha that are, that let's say are, they snap their neck, or snap a particular part of the uh, uh, spinal cord in some type of accident, you basically could lose motor or sensory function depending on the damage or both from the bot, you know, that part of the body down. And, this, and, and luckily, it doesn't always affect viscera because you do have cranial nerves that come down and control the viscera, and they're usually not going to be affected so much by damage because they don't pass through the, the vertebral column, so they might not be snapped. They're a little more flexible and not rigidly held in that canal. So um, we can look at here, particularly motor and sensory loss. So people that are sometimes paralyzed from the waist down can be paralyzed in motor and sensory or both. And that becomes a horrible issue. And what happens if they're not getting signals to the brain to maintain muscle tone or posture, they will start showing decay of muscle, shrinkage of muscle called muscle atrophy. And they can develop psychiatric issues due to the lack of sensation, not feeling senses. They even get a phenomenon called phantom body where they feel like they can feel things, but it's not there. So that ends our brief coverage of the spinal cord.